Good afternoon and welcome to Media Live on TV3. My name is Efua Tiku. The headlines this afternoon. Unidentified armed gunman gunned down in a shootout with the Tema police at Gulf City. Former Fair Wages and Salaries Commission CEO proposes review of single spying salary structure to address distortions in the payment of market premium. And on the foreign front, Egypt says technical talks between Egypt, Sudan and Ethiopia over disputed Ethiopia's great renaissance dam fails to make a breakthrough. We have details in these coming up shortly in the next one hour. Stay with us. Now on to our very first story. An unidentified armed man has been gunned down in a shootout with the Tema police at Gulf City. The deceased was among three others who allegedly robbed a lotto operator and absconded. According to the police, a lotto operator rushed to the Tema Regional Police Command with information that his office and workers have been attacked by four armed men in Tema. He further stated that the armed men took away five mobile phones and an unspecified amount of money. Police intelligence traced the armed men to a guest house at Gulf City. On seeing the police, one of the four men opened fire. Police sensing danger responded immediately by returning fire and in the process, the gunman got hit. Police retrieved one pistol with 32 rounded ammunition, a revolver and five rounds, three iPhones and one iPad. Now briefing the media, the regional police commander DC OP Nana Asamuahine said there is a manhunt for the three who are at large. The wounded suspect was taken to the police hospital but upon arrival, he was pronounced dead. And so joining us on the line is DSP Joseph Dakwa, and he's the police public relations officer. Mr. Dakwa, thank you so much for speaking with us. So can you confirm to us that one man is dead, one of the robbers is dead? Hello, Mr. Dakwa. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Yes, thank, thank you, you for spe speaking with us. Now, can you confirm that one of the robbers um, is dead? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, certainly, um, when we gathered information that uh, the army robbers had escaped to uh, a guest house at Gulf City, we followed up there, and uh, upon seeing the police coming, uh, the first person, the armed person, uh, opened fire on police, and we returned fire, and uh, that he was hit, and uh, as a result, uh, he, he was fatally wounded. Uh, we rushed into the police, uh, hospital, but unfortunately, he was pronounced dead on arrival. Uh, do you have any news on the other three? Um, that's what we are doing currently. We have uh, mounted a search for the, the three um, uh, persons who escaped. But fortunately, like you have shown, uh, we retrieve uh, uh, a sidearm or a, a pistol with 32 rounds of ammunition and a revolver with five rounds of ammunition. But as I speak, uh, with you, our men are on the ground uh, trying to, you know, discover or find out where these three armed are. So we are chasing them wherever they go. Would you say the incidence of armed robbery has increased in the Tema area? Um, I wouldn't say armed robbery in Tema area has uh, increased. I would rather say it is coming down because we've stepped up our activities uh, and. Quite recently, uh, the command has acquired a drone, uh, courtesy by the commander, the DCOP, Nana Sumahine. We've acquired a drone, which we are flying uh, to take pictures of uh, the criminal uh, havens, the, uh, the, the slums and where criminal activities are going on. So we have stepped up our activities to, you know, as it were, uh, wipe and, up, uh, and And this uh, drone is helping activities. the police to, to, to do exactly certainly, what? Certainly, certainly. You know, it's able to take pictures of areas that maybe uh, it's not accessible to police, areas that otherwise we could not have reached there, take pictures. Then we analyze the pictures and then move on. So I must say, uh, 
we, 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 we are winning the fight against the criminals. Well, many thanks to you. DSP Joseph Dakwa is the police public relations officer in Tema. Now, let's look at some other stories. And President Tukufuado has charged the Ghana Police Service to devise new strategies to improve relations with the public to promote effective ways of fighting crime. Now, the president was speaking at the official inauguration of the newly constructed office complex at the Tesano Divisional Headquarters in Accra. The new divisional headquarters located at the Tesano Police Station was financed by the president of the despite group of companies, Dr. Se Kwame. He had earlier in the year handed over a similar facility to the service at Viamwase in the Ashanti region. In a speech read on his behalf, he pledged to contribute his quota to enhance national development. Se Kwame Despite, popularly known as Dr. Despite, is known for his philanthropic activities. He has facilitated the annual blood donation exercise, the annual free transportation services, distribution of food items at Christmas, support for the sick, widows, children, the community and the nation as a whole. President Ikufuado urged the police service to work towards improving relations with the public. It is my hope and expectation that the police will enhance their engagement with the communities they serve because that is a more sustainable way of reducing crime. Residents must also cooperate with the police and give them maximum backing in the discharge of their duties. The president outlined interventions by government to resource the service. This year, we are undertaking the rehabilitation of police stations throughout the country to standardize the infrastructure. Our aim is to strengthen the police, fashioning it into an honest, disciplined, efficient, and robust force whose emphasis will be on proactive and preventative policing rather than reacting. The office complex comprises orderly rooms for divisional offices, 10-seater meeting rooms, and an executive lobby. Now, President Ekufuado has pledged government's resolve to support the University of Ghana become one of the best research institutions in the country. Now, speaking at the launch of the University of Ghana Endowment Fund to commemorate the university's 70th anniversary, the president praised the institution for its contribution towards mentoring and nurturing the country's human resource. If the endowment fund is expected to provide additional non-restricted funding to enable the university improve the delivery of its mandate. The endowment fund is also expected to assist in the provision of additional facilities and resources to enhance research and teaching, including equipment, teaching aids and space. In 1948 at this university, we only had the Faculty of Arts, Science and Commerce. That was all. Today, and our new collegiate system, we have four colleges, 21 schools, and a total of 108 departments, 25 centers, and six institutes, offering a great diversity of programs in response to the needs of the country and of our times. President Ekufado said government will play its part in supporting the university deliver on its mandate. My government fully supports and shares in your vision to become a research intensive university and we'll do all in our power to help you actualize this. I ask the University of Ghana and indeed all tertiary institutions in the country to find innovative and effective ways of linking up with industry and the corporate world to engage in quality strategic research targeted at finding practical solutions to real-life challenges of our society. Still on Education, Global Action Week for Education is one of the major focal points for the education movement. Now this year, the theme is strengthening citizen participation and accountability in education management, a milestone for achieving SDG4. Now the Ghana Blind Union, along with other civil society groups on the SDG4 platform, which is education, is calling for attention to be given to the education of persons with disability. Now this afternoon, we have 
in the studio, Peter Obinga Samoa, who is the executive director of the Ghana Blind Union, and also Bismarck, Bismarck, Peter Bismarck Kofi, who is executive director, Institute for Liberty and Policy Innovation. You're welcome to the studio, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, so in our current education system, we have the special schools, right? And in um, 2016, the inclusive education policy was launched. Can you tell us a bit about the, the policy? Yes, um, one thing about the inclusive education policy was that it was structured like that um, persons with special needs, or for that matter, persons with disability, will be able to attend school in their own environments, meaning that the schools will be adapted to meet this, the needs of the individuals in their environments, so that you no longer have to travel from one place to a special school yet you could receive education wherever you are. And one major difference, or one major uh, characteristic of this policy was that instead of uh, requiring the individual to adapt himself to the um, system or to fit into the system, the system is rather structured to accommodate those particular needs of the individual so that it becomes inclusive. So the individual is included in the entire process. I mean, it's a fantastic policy, but where are we in terms of implementing it and seeing some real action on the ground? Well, I just say we are still at, at the touchline, at the beginning, the starting point. Because if you go on the ground, not much has been done. Um, even though there has been some strides um, in that direction, we still have a really, really long way to go. We still have to make sure that blind children are able to get test books in formats which they can access. We still need to make sure that classrooms are accessible and that um, those kids in wheelchairs are able to access their classroom, whether they are steps or not, or to use the laboratories or anything on their wheelchairs and, um, and very conveniently. We still need to make sure that enough interpreters to go around so that children who are hearing impaired can also follow the instruction in school. So I would say, yes, we've began some, some strides in that direction, but there needs a lot uh, um, needs have to be done. We still need to look at our training processes for our teachers and our human resource in this respect. So we have a lot more to now, do. Now, let me go to Peter. Peter, um, I know a school like Okuyapiman has this policy and it, it, it works. Um, have you studied the system and have you been able to um, look at how it's worked there and the, and the effect it's had on both of the students? Yeah, right. Um, I was fortunate to attend uh, the Presbyterian Training College in the Coupon, where we had some of these um, uh, persons with um, disabilities among us in the same um, classrooms, attend the same, I mean, with the right. same halls and everything. And um, we're not having structures for them in terms of um, getting to staircases, you know, so some of the buildings were uh, story buildings and it was difficult for them to get to some of their rooms. There are times they need to go and fetch water. I mean, it's, it's, it's a hilly place. So moving from one end to the other end to fetch water, they, they often get these challenges to, when they, nobody helps you there. You need to work on your own. You need to make sure that you find your own uh, food, you, you get your own bucket of water. It's, everything is independent. But um, what happened was that we, we were somewhere assigned to assist some of these individuals on campus, but much need, needed to be done because the, the entire um, policy on campus to assist these individuals were not spread out. So it is some sort of voluntary. If you want to help them, you go in and help them. But if you don't want to help them, you leave them. And then they struggle to make ends meet. And this is something we need to um, uh, look at. No. Peter, briefly, uh, very briefly, in about 20 seconds, this yeah. year's theme, I mean, how strengthening citizen participation and accountability in education management, a milestone for achieving the SDG 4, um, how does it fit into this inclusive education? Yeah, right. Um, if you look at the agenda 2030, uh, page 23, um, it spells out how um, some of these things need to be done. So they, they, they spread out something like having a, a toolkit. So when these toolkits are there, we have practical documents that helps individuals to help them achieve um, inclusiveness. So for example, if governments even want to pass out certain policies, they need to have this inclusiveness. If you look at this NAPCO um, uh, program, we don't know if there's a quota for persons with disabilities. These free HHS, we don't, so, you know, so government policies are not um, inclusive. 
So unless we are able to look at Go4, and then I think Go8 also talks about employment, it talks about sustainability, it talks about um, equality in terms of assessing certain public um, um, institutions. So until we are able to put up uh, policies that will enable the government to include individuals who are into these categories and they also fare well with i mean the normal system until that we are we're not going to get to where we are but well, i thank think you. The, the thank the you very much peter. i'm afraid we have to end it here thank right. you so much for speaking with us so we've been speaking with peter besma kofi who is the executive director institute for liberty and policy innovation and peter obina someone who is also the executive director ghana blind union thank you very much gentlemen thank you now, so on to some other news. The government and Hospital Pharmacists Association has proposed negotiations with government to pay four out of eight years arrears due to wrongful placement and grading on the single spine salary structure. Now, the leadership of, of GOSPA says it will not accept any move by Fair Wages and Salaries Commission to conduct another round of job revaluation if the arrears are not paid. Gospa claims more than 200 of its members have resigned nationwide for being worse off on the single spine salary structure. It cited wrongful placement and grading, including conversion difference, as having affected their salaries for the past eight years. Despite the cabinet subcommittee agreeing in 2012 for payment to be affected, the then finance minister failed to comply. Last week, the new CEO of Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, Dr. Edward Kwapong, proposed another round of job re-evaluation for the pharmacist. But the leadership of the association has rejected the idea, claiming it had already conducted three of the job re in previous years. Three job evaluations? Why? Sarah, you are not going to do anything? No, the membership are not uh, in accord. Of course, we are preparing towards a future job evaluation because the uh, single spine will require a review, which is now... Uh, been discussed. So we would agree and do a job evaluation for that. But not to go back retrospectively to solve the problem of old. The former chairman of GOSPA, Raymond Tete, rather suggested negotiation with government to pay their 80 years arrears. And you know, government has solved problems for teachers, for others, and has paid retrospective effects. So what we are saying is that, okay, meet with us. Let's ne renegotiate and say that, okay, we can't pay you the four or five years back pay. We'll pay a year, two, three years. That's okay with us. Immediate past CEO of Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, Jasmine Graham, also rejected a new job evaluation for the pharmacist. Uh, how many times do you have to do job uh, um, re-evaluation? Re if they themselves agreed, uh, which I'm told they've agreed that they will go into a job re-evaluation, then that's a different matter altogether. The CEO of the commission, Dr. Edward Kwapong, is to meet leadership of GOSPA to resolve their grievances. We stay with issues on health, and the Ghana Association of Biomedical Laboratory Scientists have warned that the country's healthcare system risks collapse if laboratory services continue to be neglected. Now, the association has often complained that members are sidelined in decision-making processes at the various health facilities across the country. The association has also been complaining members have not been placed by government on the correct salary level since the introduction of the single spine salary structure. Now we are joined in the studio by Dr. Ignatius Awinibono, who is the president of the Ghana Association of Biomedical Laboratory Scientists. You're, work you're welcome, Dr. to the studio. Yeah, thank you very much. Now, your, your issues have been on for years. How many years now? Uh, some eight years, eight some years, six years, eight years some now, four years. Right, so yes. have you had any engagement with the current administration? You're talking about um, salaries and also not being part of decision making. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, indeed, we have had these interactions with the minister, and I would say uh, four meetings with him, and in terms of letters of caution of our intentions, we've sent close to about five of these. And some of since these- Since when? Since- uh, 20, The beginning of the current yes, yes, administration. Yes, since uh, the beginning of the current administration and all have just fallen on deaf ears. You have sent five letters to, to the yes, administration, and these letters are talking about? Essentially reminding them about outstanding issues, 
In fact, the last time we met him at a meeting on the 12th, he asked us, have you brought anything new? This was the question he asked, which means that he was well aware of the issues. We told him it's the same old issue, and we are uh, worried that 15, 14 years down the uh, months down the line, you have still not given our people the response. As leadership, we have gone around the country to give them your word that we take to be from an honorable person. And we can no longer go back to So we are talking waters. about laboratory technicians here. So what are some of these, these issues that we are talking about? Yes. In fact, the, there's an evolution in the profession. Uh, the profession is made up of a number of cadre. The technician is one cadre. The scientist is another cadre. The assistant is another cadre. But essentially, we are all under the medical laboratory scientists. In fact, Congress resolved that we now be called medical laboratory scientists in accordance with the law uh, passed by Parliament in 2013. So we are now Ghana Association of Medical Laboratory Scientists. The issues are these. One, that as we talk, there is no uh, sustainable funding uh, arrangement for the laboratory uh, services in the country. You'll be surprised that the laboratory is the cash cow of the hospital. And the markups and the margins, uh, supernormal profits on our services are, are very huge. Government or the health institutions milk on these, feed on them, and they do not have uh, any system in place but do to you, send part of this money do you to have, retool Do you the have labs. the necessary tools at the various laboratories? That, that is exactly what, what, what is necessitating this, that uh, by and large, there are logistical challenges, there are equipment right. challenges. I know government has tried to do, but because they do not understand the real practice of our profession, they are not able to uh, invest properly in the laboratories. So and quickly, because of that, we are limited even in expansion in this country. Now, so quickly, yes. um, about these letters you've sent to the minister, and what is your, your next course of action? In fact, uh, let quickly on that. Yes, yes. Uh, let me uh, quickly state that the next course of action, uh, we've given a roadmap. We are currently wearing red bands across the country. We'll have some peaceful uh, demonstrations across the country to let government know that if they have not heard the issues, then they should hear them properly. And to end with uh, withdrawal of services, emergency services, including the blood bank services, including uh, services that are supposed to be done for the purpose of surveillance, right. antenatal services. This will be drawn across oh, the country. We hope it doesn't get to that point. But yeah. thank you so much for speaking with us. Dr. Ignatius Awinibon, who is the president of the Ghana Association of Biomedical Laboratory Scientists. You're still watching Midday Live on TV3. Now, on MTN Video Report today, Sam Centeria, our citizen journalist, reports on the poor state of Odahu RC Primary School in the Amancia South District, which needs urgent attention. This edifice is a building that is used by the other AUC kindergarten one and two. It is an abode for sheep and goats. I am just standing in front of a classroom block which houses the class four and five people. The wall has a lot of cracks. The windows have been veered off. Looking at the nature of the cracks and the deficit in its setup. Reporting, there we are something. Nice one, huh? So many thanks to you. You can also send your video via uh, MTN number 055-1433. 044. The number again, 055-143-3044. Now, some news just in the NPP has noted with concern an alleged attack on a journalist by one of its supporters, Haji Afati, 
we distance ourselves from the act and condemn it unreservedly. That's according to the MPP. The party wishes to assure Ghanaian journalists that it respects and cherishes the role of the media as partners in development and does not condone any action intended to suppress press freedom. No journalist should feel intimidated and must continue to discharge his or her duties without fear. Though the NPP has already begun an internal inquiry into the alleged incident, we will also cooperate with other agencies in investigating same. Now, so that's according to the MPP on the attack on the journalist. You watch Media Live on TV3. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Midday Live. Now in business this afternoon, a banking expert, Dr. Richmond Etuyahene, has lauded the move by the central bank to appoint an advisor for Sovereign Bank. He explains the appointment of an advisor is the first step of action to prevent the situation from deteriorating. The Bank of Ghana has appointed an advisor for Sovereign Bank to oversee its operations. The appointment due to some governance and capital challenges the bank is battling with. Speaking on the development, banking expert Dr. Rich Monichahene commended the move. He explained that the distressed situation of several banks could have been avoided with the appointment of an advisor. The advisor is the first leg of the issues. When we go to session 107, we appoint official administrator. When we don't get it, then we get to session 108. Then we appoint a receiver and a liquidator, like in the case of Capital and UT Bank. Dr. Chahene encouraged banks to cooperate with the Bank of Ghana. It means the other five or six are answering their queries and having uh, preparedness to support what they are doing. If you don't answer the queries, Bank of Ghana, the surprising report, then Bank of Ghana will have every right. To do that. The Bank of Ghana has a range of powers under the Banks and Specialized Deposit Taking Institutions Act of 2016, Act 930, to take prompt action to address supervisory concerns it identifies in a regulated institution. One of such powers is to appoint an advisor under Section 101 1 of Act 930. Still in business, a former first deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, Melissa Na, has admonished countries which signed the African Free Trade Agreement to commit to its effective implementation. Now, he was speaking in an interview with TV3, and he said this will create opportunities for African firms to become bigger, more specialized, and more competitive internationally. Free trade advocates argue that lower barriers to trade will make it easier for African countries to develop regional supply chains and export more finished goods rather than raw materials, as is the case at present. The United Nations Economic Commission on Africa forecasts that if the largest African economies join the free trade area, inter-Africa trade would grow 50% in the following five years. More than 40 African governments signed a continent-wide free trade agreement in March under which they committed to cut tariffs on 90% of goods to bolster intra-Africa trade and boost growth. Managing Director of Pan-Africa Capital Ghana Limited, Wenslav Savriga, said financial firms in Ghana must position themselves to finance big ticket projects since trade is envisaged to grow in the coming years. Speaking in an exclusive interview with TV3, former first deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, Melissa Na, said African countries must commit to ensuring the success of a free trade agreement. If you look at um, the performance of uh, African, African countries, as far as trade among ourselves is concerned, you see that is is abysmally low. And trade is development. You cannot develop if you don't trade among yourself. So it is um, heartwarming that this idea of the African Trade Pact has been mooted by the African Union. And I expect that um, African countries to do their utmost best to, you know, approve this uh, pact. I also did mention certain constraints that hamper, you know, um, trade among African countries, namely 
infrastructure, lack of appropriate infrastructure. If you go to Europe, you can travel from, you know, one country to the other seamlessly. Intra-Africa trade, which was about $170 billion in 2017, accounts for about 15% of the continent's trade. This compares to 67% in the EU and 58% in Asia. More than 60% of African exports to the EU are primary products, while about 70% of goods imported to the continent from the EU are manufactured. And that's it for business, but still in the news, the La Inquantanan Medina Municipal Assembly is forced to rely on the army because some squatters occupying the Redco flatland are defiant and have refused to relocate. Now, coordinating director of the La Inquantanan Municipality says negotiations are ongoing between the assembly and the army hierarchy to completely close down the slum. The slum is home to some 5,000 squatters of various nationalities including Liberians, Nigerians, Ghanaians and Ivorians. Well, we are talking about 48 engineers regiment. They have the equipment. You know what? The equipment that we use wasn't stronger that the that's why we had a longer period. But there are other structures that we want to bring them down. And we need heavier equipment and they have. That's why I want to fall on them for those equipments. And you, know, you can have the equipment, but the person operating it, if the person is not well conscientized, you will just, you know, you know that the think were there. It took us some hours, the first group left and we were, we were caught in the middle of the uh, of the struggle. We have to go back and organize fresh equipment before we manage to get uh, what we are having now. We couldn't finish with the negotiation, so tell you I will go back to them. And when I get the final day that they will be coming, I will inform you. But meanwhile, we have our men on the ground. Every day we go to the field and we continue to make sure that they don't come back. When I see a new structure or reorganized structure, we we'll put those structures down. Now, traditional soap, Azuma Blue, provides job for women at Mampinase. Despite the dangers associated with the use of soda, making soap from this substance has provided a source of income for 63-year-old Yabuatema. Our Shanti Regional Correspondent Beatrice Piogabra has visited Madame Yabuatema at her Azuma Blue soap factory at Mampinase, and we are joined by her for more details. These balls you see here are local made soup. The women here call them Azuma Blue, or that is the name that is referred to when you get to the market and you need some local soups to buy. The owner of this place is Mami Watma, who has been doing this business for about 18 years. You want to engage Mami Yabwatma to see how she goes about making the soup and how it has helped her over the 18 years that she has been in this business. A brebain sana a womb, some more yea, if you know what to move, so that to make up him some more bo, a we know a brebain sana a womb. A woot to moody an eddy, Nisura, no, a yan a more de, sick as some. A giant cracker, a bin musha bonoma, a free free beer my, and a eddy, near Pippon Sweet Day, Ningun one Sweet Day, and two funny pass here, one crocker in the panels of a quayao. It was so unya or do be man crock rono. Now only a mina and a moya or do. Now, Obebeka say, a nescent no pampina a woman no perfume be any man as I do him be a enim. I didn't some more for perfume be a gumna seminano, ain't me any ham. Ya and your dozen can be any son and came your man crow for. Now, would you see a man in your man more in him? And so I shall say the woman almost any yet, and Tomu is who Fiji. Any chance any cop mono, yana sent you to a moon penny sent you any see a And then a moon for gloves, mum, and shaman some of the robber ne socks ne the shaman son. We the gross no show and so boy and yefe. And it is a robber near you know, socks now the bob man aye. Sent a mitraum and sent to be be able to touch me, be honest as me and my dimly cab and them. And she said, Oh, because obey a mum, what? Say be our brain will be beyond bits media, yes, seven and do name terminate brain over call from Sana. A dance and a cow be here, say a debre. 
se 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 o mo nya mais ni bia ma ya ma na twetwa ma yedi a ada wo nko ana wo nyeni pa mienu ka na se wo be djuma dia ka ni ba ti pa Beatrice Fiogabra CV3 News Mampnasi You still watching me live on TV3 and as part of activities marking the West Africa Road Safety Organization Day, the National Road Safety Commission has given indication it will lead processes to review the law on the use of motorbikes for commercial purposes, commonly referred to as Okada. Now, per the Ghana Road Traffic Regulations Act 2009, the use of motorcycles for commercial purposes is illegal, but various interest groups have mounted pressure on government to legalize the trade, all to no avail as yet, but the Commission says it is committed to leading the process that will lead the review of the law that bars the use of commercial motorbikes, possibly making it legal. Now, let's take a look at some regulation here. Now, Re Regulation 128 says prohibition of use of motorcycles and tricycles for commercial purposes that seeks to prevent the public from the dangers associated with the use of such mode of transport in the highly populated urbanized communities. So, in, in view of the urbanized developments and the population in Accra alone, it's, it's going to be quite um, a bit trying to get motorcycles in there. But let's go on to the line and speak with May Obriya Boa. She's the executive director of the National Road Safety Commission and joins me on the phone line. Good afternoon, May. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for speaking to us. Now, we, we all know motorbikes are involved in um, some robbery cases and also committing other forms of crimes mm. and road infractions. Yeah. Now, considering all these, will you still back for the legalization of it into a commercial um, venture? Thank you, and good afternoon to your viewers. Um, like I said, we need to look at the whole process. I personally would never would have gone for the legalization of the uh, uh, Okada because of the safety aspect of it that we see. Uh, you, if you look at the statistics, it shows clearly that for the past year, there have been uh, an increase, a phenomenal increase on the, the, the death and increase due to the use of the motorcycle. However, um, the, the other school of thought is that we have the, the bikes in the system, and therefore we should look at the way of maybe regularizing them to ensure that they, they, um, they obey the road traffic regulations, etc. So the LI-2180 is going to be reviewed, not only for the, the uh, motorcycle, but the whole uh, law. We are going to review it. And one of the issues that will come out strongly is this regulation 128 in connection with the commercial use of motorcycles. So this is the time that we, as a commission, will lead the whole country in those uh, debates that we are having, those for against uh, the use of the motorcycle for commercial purposes, will make our various submissions and weigh their pros and cons, and then see the way to go as a nation. Now, May, so, you're, you're, saying, yes, you're, say, you're saying that the, the, the motorcycles are already in existence, mm -hmm. and so we should... Um, legalize it. Is that? The, I, I didn't say that. I never said that. I said that. Yes, they are in the system, and there, there, there's a school of thought that is saying that it should be legalized. However, I told you at the beginning, personally, and as a committee, we would have never approved that. But because they are already in the system, we will have to look at the pros and cons and see what to do. There's a school of thought also that is saying that. Well, for the uh, main cities. The capital cities, maybe we should not allow them. But for the villages where there are no means of transport, and that's the only means of transport, we may have to look at it. So that's why I think that we would need a public debate on this so that we, as a country we get a consensus on it and then we take a decision. So um, it, I never say that it's going to be legalized. Well, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you, May Obriya Boa. She's the executive director of the National Road Safety Commission. And now let's look at some more stories. Now, Deputy Trade and Industry Minister Carlos Ahinkra ex expects the strategic engagement with China to increase exports from Ghana into the Asian country. Now, although Ghana's exports to, to China hit $1.85 million, representing over 41% increase in 2017, trade between the two countries is still imbalanced due to the large volumes of imports from China. 
This year's edition is hosting 50 Chinese manufacturers covering different sectors including construction materials and machinery, solar energy and lighting, and home electronics. In 2016, Ghana's total exports to China amounted to about 3.69 billion Ghana cities, in contrast to 7.7 .7 billion Ghana cities on imports. According to the Deputy Minister of Trade and Industry, Carlos Ahinkwa, Ghana's exports to China remains very marginal with a negative balance sheet. China, as you can see uh, today, is taking over the business wave uh, in Africa to dominate. Mm -hmm. compared, if you compare to other uh, countries or other developed economies in this world. And they intend to reciprocate this um, uh, benevolence by asking or allowing Africans to also send our goods to them. But unfortunately, we don't even have the opportunity to show them what we produce here in Ghana. And it's, 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 it's become uh, a norm that from out of Ghana we only send traditional exports like gold, like wood, was they bring in here all the manufactured uh, uh, products. The Director of Investor Service of GIPC, Edward Ashon Lati, expressed optimism that by engaging China strategically, Ghana can attract sustainable partnerships and investments that would contribute more significantly to the country's growth and economic development. Strong government commitment to diversify Ghana's economy, create an enabling business environment and improve the country's business competitiveness. Policies like the One Dish One Factory program, the planting for food and job, present several opportunities for, priv for the private sector, both in Ghana and China. He encouraged Ghanaian businesses participating in the event to network aggressively and explore avenues for potential partnerships with their Chinese counterparts for mutual growth and benefit of their respective businesses. The three-day exhibition will also cover the print, packaging and plastic, clothing and textiles, as well as food and beverages sectors. This is Midday Live on TV3. Stay with us. We'll be right back. To some international news, Egypt's foreign minister has said technical talks between Egypt, Sudan and Ethiopia over a disputed dam Ethiopia is building on the Nile River failed to make a breakthrough. This comes amid pressure for a dam for a deal before the project opens this year. A $4 billion hydroelectric project that Cairo fears will reduce waters that run to its fields and reservoirs from Ethiopia's highlands and Var Sudan. Addis Ababa hopes the dam will make it a hub for the electricity-hungry region and denies it will undermine Egypt's access to water. Sameh Shukri said technical experts who met in Addis Ababa last week did not achieve a breakthrough. Ties between Egypt and Sudan were strained when Khartoum bagged the dam because of its need for electricity. The three African neighbors are set to meet on May 15 for further talks, Shukri said adding Egypt had initially proposed several earlier dates for negotiations, but they were turned down by the two other countries. Earlier this month, talks in Khartoum between Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan also failed to reach agreement, but were described by Sudan's foreign minister as constructive. Now to the U.S. where President Donald Trump will announce on Tuesday whether he will put, pull out of the Iran nuclear deal or stay in and work with, with European allies who say it has successfully halted Iran's nuclear ambitions. Trump has consistently threatened to pull out of the 2015 agreement because it does not address Iran's ballistic missile program or its role in wars in Syria and Yemen and does not permanently prevent Tehran from developing nuclear weapons. A senior U.S. official close to the process said France, Germany and Britain had moved significantly to address Trump's concern over the ballistic missile program. The terms under which international inspectors visit suspect Iranian sites and sunset clauses under which some terms of the deal expire. But it was not clear whether those last-ditch efforts had made enough progress to persuade Trump to stay in the pact. European leaders have warned that a U.S. withdrawal would undo years of work that led to and sustained a landmark deal that has kept nuclear weapons out of Iran's hands.
And that's it for international new now news. Now on to some entertainment news. And dance hall artist Stone Boy says if anyone needs his service, they should contact his manager Black City and Xylophone Media. This latest statement from Stone Boy contravenes an earlier statement from the Xylophone Group, insisting people should con contact them if they need the services of any artist under their label. Now, first runner-up of TV3's 2018 Ghana's Most Beautiful, Baba Butchery has urged Baba Butchery has urged guardians to regularly visit the hospital for checkups for early detection of diseases. The nurse made the call at a free general health screening organized for the people of Winneba, where she hails from. Diseases tested included HIV, hepatitis B, eye diseases, among others. The Futu Municipal Public Health nurse Henrietta Amponsa Chen Crime took participants through health tips. The founder of Your Health Matters Ghana, Gladys Ofusudazi, advised patrons against bad eating habits. Through all the exercises, we realized that um, hypertension is on the high. And once you have hypertension, the likelihood of getting diabetes is very thin. Diabetes and hypertension go hand in hand. So the best option to prevent this illness is to exercise regularly, you eat healthy diet, you have a lot of rest, you take in a lot of fluid. First runner-up of the 2018 Ghana's Most Beautiful, Baba Butri encouraged Ghanaians to regularly visit the hospital for checkups for early detection of diseases. Baba further disclosed her project dubbed Psych Ghana will soon be launched to raise awareness on mental health. I'm a nurse by profession and a mental health nurse. I decided to use just the week of our virtual celebration to organize um, a health screening exercise. And uh, one is to say thank you to the people of Winneba for the support they gave me throughout the GMB competition and to also help my, my people such that I know most of them don't visit, don't like visiting their hospitals for one reason or the other. So we wanted to come close to them so that um, they would enjoy all the services they are likely to enjoy when they get to the health facilities. Well, that's that will be it for Midday Live on TV3. My name is Efua Tiego. For more news, go to 3news.com. Enjoy the rest of our programs.